When I'm remembering Christmas past, I'm thinking of a game that I played in this sermon a couple of years ago, and I want to do it again because I liked it so much the last time. But I have all new material this year, so don't worry. It will be a new and different game. The game is I read the first line of some famous work of literature, and you guess what it is just by the first line, how the, how, the, how the book begins. We'll start with an easy one. Call me Ishmael. Moby Dick. Moby Dick. It's an easy one. Another one that should be pretty easy. It is, tr- it is a truth universally acknowledged that a single man in possession of a good fortune must be in want of a wife. Pride and prejudice. Pride and prejudice, well done. Now a little, once a little harder. It was a dark and stormy night The rain fell in torrents, except at occasional intervals when it was checked by a violent gust of wind which swept up the streets, for it is in London that our scene lies, rattling along the housetops and fiercely agitating the scanty flame of the lamps that struggled against the darkness. How the Grinch stole Christmas. No. (laughs) That was all one sentence. Any guesses? I mean, everybody knows it was a dark and stormy night. Obviously, Snoopy wrote that many times. This was not Snoopy. He, He got it from somebody else. Anybody know what it was? Bulwer Lytton. Well done, the historian in the room. It was Sir Edward Bulwer Lytton's book called Paul Clifford, which I'm sure every one of you read at some point. I'm sure it must be as fascinating as the first line sounds. All right, another one that's sort of notorious that you may be able to guess. Stately, plump Buck Mulligan came from the stairhead bearing a bowl of lather on which a mirror and razor lay crossed. A yellow dressing gown, ungirdled, was sustained gently behind him on the mild morning air. He held the ball aloft and intoned, in troibo ad altare dei. Any guesses on that one? What did you guess? Um, I said, let's see, Christmas Santa Claus. Nope. Nope. Not even close, actually. Pretty far from Santa Claus, actually. That's the first line of Ulysses by James Joyce a book that I'm sure everybody has also read because it's so easy and accessible. (coughs) One more. I wish either my father or my mother, or indeed both of them, as they were in duty both equally bound to it, had minded what they were about when they begot me, had they duly considered how much depended upon what they were then doing, that not only the production of a rational being was concerned in it, but that possibly the happy formation and temperature of his body, perhaps his genius and the very cast of his mind, and for aught they knew to the contrary, even the fortunes of his whole house might take their turn from the humors and dispositions which were then uppermost. Had they duly weighed and considered all this and proceeded accordingly, I am verily persuaded I should have made a quite different figure in the world from that in which the reader is likely to see me. All one sentence. St. Paul. It is not St. Paul. Well, that is actually not a bad guess. <laughs> uh, it's famous because it's about the longest first line of any major work of English literature. It's called Tristram Shandy by Lawrence Stern. Again, one that most of us probably haven't read, but when you go looking up on the internet, what's the longest first line of a book? It's the one that comes up. Well done, dear friends. There's your your Christmas game for the day. You can take that home and play that with your relatives. I'm sure they'll be as excited as you are to do it here this morning. (laughs) It is important, though, to remember that beginnings do matter. How we start a story tells us a lot about how the story is going to continue. It sets the tone. Every one of these, in a way, gave you an idea of what the story was going to be like, what the narrator or the voice of the person speaking was going to be like. You began to get clues about what might, else might happen in the story later on. If you prefer movies as your references, maybe you think of Citizen Kane, where there is the reference to, to Rosebud all through the movie. You don't know what it is until the very end when there's a snow globe that has the sled in it that has Rosebud on it, and he's remembering what he had as a child. He's been trying to get back to it, the whole story. The whole story has turned on what you saw at the very beginning, but you didn't know it until the very end. Something like that is going on in the Gospels, although we treat them as a different kind of literature and we don't often think of them in this way. If you go and you read the four Gospels, you'll see that the writers have very different intentions in the way that they write and what they're putting right at the beginning of the story as a way of telling you where the story is going to go. The Gospel of Mark starts right off with an adult Jesus. 
no baby, no manger, no mushy stuff. Just there's a story to tell. It's important, and we're going to start it right now. Within the first chapter, Jesus has been baptized and is recruiting his followers because Mark has no time to waste. In Matthew is a long genealogy of Jesus. I encourage you to look at the St. John Bible, the, the illustration that's opposite the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew. All the generations that the, the writer of the Gospel of Matthew wants you to know come between Adam and Jesus. The whole span of God's work in the world. Something has going on here that has been going on for a long time. God has always been trying to do this. If only we would sit up and take notice. The Gospel of Luke begins with the whole nativity thing that we heard last night. Although interestingly, there are no wise men in Luke. You got to go to Matthew to find the wise men. But Luke has the shepherds and the angels, the manger, and stories about Jesus as a child before he moves on into his adult ministry. I think Luke is trying to say there's something new happening here. God is doing something in a new and different way. Look, it begins with a baby. Kind of makes sense, doesn't it? And then there's John, who begins with the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. Everything was created by and through the Word. John wants us to know that there is something important about the way creation is spoken, the way everything begins with what we say. I have said here before, and I will continue to say until you're tired of hearing it, that words have power in our religious understanding. Words mean something more than just empty things we toss out. We talk about talk being cheap. The reason for that is that most of the time, those words that we say are cheap have no real creative power behind them. They really have no intention of even being fulfilled behind them. That's not what John is talking about. John is talking about word, words, the word, and the words spoken by God that have that creative power, that make something happen, that express the fullness of God's restlessness until everything is perfected, until everything is as it should be in the vision of God the vision that we get only a tiny glimpse of on occasions like this one. So I think there are things here we should be taking away, things we should be looking for. This is the beginning of the story, but it doesn't end here. It continues for every Sunday for the rest of our lives. But we're getting hints now of what all this may mean for us, what we should be listening for in the rest of the story. The first is to understand that somehow the nature of God is centered on and revolves around creation and creativity. I don't mean sort of ticky-tacky internet creativity. This isn't a MacGyver exercise in making a jet engine out of plastic straws and chewing gum. This is a creativity, a, a, a focus on creation that will not rest when anything is imperfect, that will not be satisfied to concede that death and imperfection, brokenness and sadness, sorrow, can ever be the end of anything. All those are our admissions that there's nothing more to do. And that is never where God finds God's self. And certainly is not where God finds God's self with us, if only we will notice. There is something about that that spills over onto you and to me was right there in the reading this morning. We have the power to become children of God. We're brought into the family business. And when we do that, we too become co-creators with God. That's a big order, dear friends, a whole lot to lay on us as a Christmas present today. Oh, by the way, each one of us is supposed to be dissatisfied with the idea that death and imperfection and sadness and brokenness should ever be enough. Take that into Boxing Day and the day after and see what it leads you to do. <laughs> Maybe there's a little work out there in the world yet to do. We walk out this door, we will find the brokenness of the world just waiting to hear 
this message. Also, I think it's worth meditating on the fact that this says that nothing can ever truly be destroyed by any power other than God's. That which God creates, no one else can destroy. And it is not in the nature of God to destroy anything, which means there is no power that will stand against the power of God. There is no spoiler. There is nothing that will try to break anything good down in the world that will prevail against the will of God that good should be sustained, built up, increased, multiplied, overflowing. Surely that is part of the joy that we take away from today, that it can't be contained just in today, and nothing that happens today can overcome it. Nothing can quench that candle that is lit. As I've also said, it's worth remembering that we somehow are brought into this. You and I share in all of this. And that it all begins simply with a word. Today the word is Alleluia. Today the word is Hosanna. God is once again among us. God is once again here present with us, as God always is, but today we remember it especially. Let this be the beginning of a beautiful story that we write in the sight of God, in the wisdom of God, in the love of God, in the reflection of God's glory today and every day that we carry this glory out of this place and into the world. Beginnings matter, dear friends. Let this be a good one today. Amen.